Have you ever wondered where the copper that powers the electricity in your home, your cell phone, or even electric cars comes from? This reddish metal is everywhere, in the cables that light our cities, in engines, in heating systems, and in the technology we use every day. But to obtain a single ton of copper, hundreds of tons of rock must be removed and processed. This is how the Earth gives us one of the most valuable and widely used metals in the world. Copper is not just another metal, it has been and continues to be a fundamental ally in the history of human progress. From the earliest civilizations, which used it to make tools and ornaments, to the present day, where it powers electrical systems and cutting-edge technologies, this reddish material has accompanied every stage of our development. Its value lies primarily in its unique properties. It is one of the best conductors of electricity and heat found in nature, making it the ideal material for manufacturing cables, electric motors, transformers, and power transmission systems. Added to this is its high resistance to corrosion, its flexibility, and its malleability, qualities that make it easy to mold into different shapes without losing efficiency. A notable feature is that copper is infinitely recyclable, it can be melted down and reused as many times as necessary without losing quality. In fact, much of the copper in use today comes from recycling processes, making it a sustainable and strategic resource for humanity. In our homes, it's present in virtually everything around us. The wiring that carries electricity to every corner, water pipes, heating systems, and the small electronic components that power phones, computers, and appliances. In industry, it ensures that huge generators and power stations operate safely and stably, keeping entire cities powered. But its importance doesn't stop there. In the transition to clean energy, copper is irreplaceable. Wind turbines, solar panels and electric cars rely on it in large quantities. Without copper, plans for a sustainable future simply wouldn't be possible. Therefore, this metal is not only part of humanity's present, but also its future. And here the big question arises. Where do we get this essential resource? Copper, unlike other metals such as gold or silver, rarely appears in its pure state in nature. It is generally found associated with other minerals within the Earth's crust, in proportions that vary greatly from one place to another. This low concentration makes the first challenge in copper mining to locate deposits where the metal content is high enough to make exploitation profitable. To achieve this, teams of geologists and specialists carry out exhaustive work combining different techniques surface geological studies, chemical analysis of samples, laboratory tests, and sophisticated seismic studies are carried out to read what is happening underground. In addition, exploratory drilling is carried out to obtain rock cores and precisely determine the presence and quality of the mineral. Only when the concentrations are proven to be economically viable is the start of the mining phase authorized. One of the most representative examples in the world is the Chuquicamata mine, located in the heart of the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. This open pit deposit is so vast that from an airplane it resembles a gigantic crater excavated in the middle of an arid and extreme landscape. Its magnitude is impressive. More than 300,000 tons of copper are extracted there each year, which involves removing millions of tons of rock in the process. But reaching the ore is no simple task. Before reaching the copper veins, enormous volumes of waste material must be removed, that is, rock of no commercial value. In some areas, this protective layer can be up to 100 meters thick, requiring the use of colossal machinery and a level of high precision planning. Only after this titanic effort is access to the mineral, which, after undergoing long crushing, smelting and refining processes, will give rise to the copper we use every day. Large-scale mining requires very different procedures than those imagined with simple hand tools. The hardness of the rock and the enormous dimensions of a mine make it impossible to work with traditional methods, so controlled drilling and blasting techniques are used to fragment the land safely and efficiently. The process begins with enormous drilling machines capable of opening more than 100 holes in a single day. These holes, known as augers, reach depths of nearly 16 meters, equivalent to the height of a five-story building. Their distribution across the ground is not random. Specialized engineers design precise drilling patterns that ensure that, upon detonation, the rock fractures evenly and the mineral can be extracted without generating unnecessary risks. 
Once drilling is complete, each hole is loaded with a carefully prepared explosive mixture. The main component is usually ammonium nitrate combined with fuel, to which a more powerful explosive known as ANFO is added. To control the shock wave and direct the energy toward the rock fracture, the holes are sealed with inert material that acts as a plug. The moment of detonation is one of the most delicate in the mining process. From a secure control post, an operator activates the programmed sequence. The explosions don't occur all at once, but rather with intervals of just two milliseconds between them. This staggered pattern prevents the force from dispersing haphazardly and allows the rock to break into manageable blocks, while minimizing dust generation and debris projection. Although each blast has enough power to bring down a skyscraper, the use of timing technology and precise calculations turns blasting into a controlled tool designed to achieve maximum performance with maximum safety. The result? A fragmented terrain, ready for heavy machinery to begin the loading and transport of the ore. When the blasting is complete and safety teams confirm that there is no risk of collapses or residual explosions, one of the most impressive phases of large-scale mining begins the loading and transport of the material. At this point, the fragmented rock is ready to be removed from the mine and sent to the next stages of the process. The work falls to heavy machinery designed to operate in extreme conditions. The stars of the show are the hydraulic shovels, steel colossi capable of lifting between 55 and 88 tons of material in a single operation, equivalent to the weight of a medium-sized commercial airplane. With each movement of its gigantic bucket, the shovel deposits the rock into the enormous mining trucks waiting at the edge of the loading line. These trucks are veritable rolling fortresses, with a height of nearly 7 meters, wheels several meters in diameter, and engines of extraordinary power, they can carry up to 400 tons of rock. To put this figure into perspective, imagine that each trip carries the equivalent of 300 average automobiles. From the ground, a worker feels tiny next to these machines, which seem more like mobile constructions than vehicles. Surprisingly, despite moving such volumes, the copper content in this material is very low. On average, less than 0.5% of the rock contains usable copper. This means that for every 200 tons of material extracted, barely one ton of refined copper will be obtained. This disproportionate nature demonstrates the magnitude of the logistical and energy effort required by the mining industry to meet global demand. To efficiently coordinate the constant movement of shovels, trucks and excavators, the mine has a centralized control center. From a tower resembling that of an airport, engineers and operators monitor each unit in the fleet in real time using satellite systems and specialized software. There, routes are determined, loads are monitored, and every minute of operation is optimized so that the mine's gigantic machinery operates with maximum precision and safety. Copper processing directly depends on the type of ore being extracted. When the deposit is rich in oxide minerals, a widely used method in the industry is leaching. This process begins with the accumulation of large quantities of previously fragmented rock on special platforms within the mine, known as leach pads. Once arranged in enormous mounds, the rocks are irrigated in a controlled manner with a dilute sulfuric acid solution. The liquid slowly descends through the pores of the rock mass for several weeks, reacting with the mineral and dissolving the copper compounds present in the stone. The result of this filtration is a solution enriched with copper ions, which is carefully collected in channels and storage pools. From there it passes through a solvent extraction process, in which the copper is separated from impurities and concentrated for the next stage, electrodeposition. In this phase, the copper solution is introduced into tanks containing thin metal sheets called cathodes. A constant electric current is applied, causing the copper ions to migrate toward these plates, gradually being deposited as pure metallic copper. In a period of approximately 10 days, each cathode can accumulate a thickness of about 2.5 centimeters and reach a weight of over 120 kilograms. Most surprisingly, the purity level achieved in this process reaches 99.99%, an essential standard for manufacturing electrical cables, motors, electronic components, and high-tech equipment. When the mineral is sulfide, the process is longer and more complex. It first passes through a rotating mill, where steel balls crush the rock into tiny particles. From there, the material passes through a secondary grinding circuit until it is reduced to powder. Chemical reagents and a foaming agent are then added. The mixture is introduced into flotation cells where air bubbles drag the copper particles to the surface. 
This metal-laden foam is collected and filtered, obtaining a concentrate with a purity of 25 to 30 percent. The concentrate travels by train to the smelting plant. There, it is mixed with silica sand, which acts as a flux, removing impurities. At extremely high temperatures, the material turns into a lustrous liquid. The slag, containing iron and other compounds, floats to the surface, while the liquid copper concentrates at the bottom with an initial purity of 60%. In a second furnace, the copper percentage rises to 98%. Giant cranes then transfer the molten metal to another furnace for final purification, achieving a purity of 99.4%. At this stage, it is poured into moulds forming large slabs known as anodes. The copper slabs, still with certain impurities, are transported to a refinery where the process is completed. There, they are placed in tanks with an electrolytic solution, facing thin metal plates called cathodes. When current is applied, the copper atoms migrate from the anodes to the cathodes, depositing as pure metal, while the impurities precipitate to the bottom. After several weeks, the result is 99.99% pure copper, ready to be transformed into cables, motors and electronic devices. Refined copper is introduced into vertical furnaces where it is melted again. The liquid passes into rectangular moulds about 6 metres long and is cooled with water jets. A system of rollers progressively reduces its diameter until rods about 7 millimetres thick are obtained. These rods are rolled into spirals that fall onto steel reels. They are then compacted for easy transport. These coils are then sent to factories where they are converted into wires and cables ready to carry electricity to homes, industries and entire cities. Copper's journey from rock buried in a desert to becoming the conductive wire that lights our homes is a demonstration of human ingenuity and the power of modern engineering. A process that combines explosives, colossal machinery, chemical processes and cutting-edge technology to produce one of the most essential materials of our time. So every time you turn on a light, charge your phone or listen to music on your headphones, there is an invisible part of this titanic process accompanying you. Copper, the metal that connects the world.